Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, video that's going to be all about the Aeolian mode. Uh, this is live, so uh, anything could happen. Uh, and I'm going to pretty much get straight on and into the presentation. So uh, these music videos are all about music uh, enrichment of the soul and leading to hopefully some sort of bliss um, and yes the Aeolian mode is the sixth mode of the diatonic major scale and what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the mode and some of the characteristics and uh, eventually do some demonstrations later on these will be indexed later on uh, probably tomorrow uh, so you can just skip about in the chapters and find the bits that are relevant for you depending on your level of ability so the aeolian mode is the sixth mode of the diatonic major scale so it's a, just an easy way of referring back to something that's perhaps more standard that everybody learns so everybody does learn a standard major scale uh, and this is the easiest way to learn the modes to start with but it, it it is a complicated way of thinking about it and I'll go more into that as we uh, carry on the presentation so the characteristics of this mode is that it's got a, a, a root note a major second a minor third obviously the, the third is the thing that makes it either major or minor in this instance it's minor a perfect fourth perfect fifth and then a minor sixth and a minor seventh and the minor sixth and the minor seventh is where it differs from both the uh, the other main diatonic minor scales, uh, the melodic minor, which will have a raised sixth, a major sixth, and a raised seventh, a major seventh, and th that's ascending and then descending. It will be th in this configuration, the minor sixth and the minor seventh. And when it comes to the harmonic minor, you have a minor sixth, but you'll have a major seventh, so you have a, a bigger gap. Case uses, uh, you find this a lot in classical music, folk music especially, but also prevalent in, prevalent in jazz and rock. So it's a minor scale, obviously it's called the natural minor, you very often see it referenced as the natural minor, and it has a weak sounding minor sixth and minor seventh, and this is one of the aspects of it that makes it sound slightly bland, in my opinion. It's, it's like an easy scale to learn that will cover you for different types of musics. Um, and especially if you're learning rock or jazz, sometimes there are other modes or scales that might be better, especially in jazz. It is quite a bland scale. So the learning dis difficulty is easy to moderate, which basically means the easy part is relating it back to the diatonic major scale and finding which degree it starts on and ends on. And the moderate part is that section where you have to think, right, well, it's a scale in its own right and it has these characteristics. But luckily in this instance, if you know your diatonic minor scales and especially the melodic minor descending, then it's that very same scale. So you do need to be able to transpose these into your various different 12 keys. Uh, so you do need to know that that scale you need to know the scale shapes and hopefully the scale construction to help you be able to play the scale when you're improvising and obviously be able to adapt your thought from the Ionian mode uh, will help you if you're in trouble especially if you're in a, a, a really alien key to you and always be watching out for that minor sixth and minor seventh songs that use the Aeolian mode uh, well there's some when you look this up on say Wikipedia or just on the internet in general but I've found some other ones I've done some digging as I normally do and I have found some examples now before I say which bands and which songs I, I should point out that I noticed something because I usually start with the Beatles and actually I had a great deal of difficulty finding a song that is in the Aeolian mode, certainly exclusively. Uh, and it's a very interesting thing about the Beatles that 
They looked like they had a little bit of trouble writing in the Aeolian mode. Maybe they didn't want to, or maybe they couldn't. Maybe they were too um, obsessed with finding a major feel in, in the mode. In other words, they wanted to find a dominant chord rather than that they were happy with a minor chord. So um, it is a very odd one for the Beatles not to have too many examples. And I, I had a lot of trouble when I looked through. So hence this list that I came up with. Um, and the first three uh, in the list, Dire Straits Tunnel of Love, Dire Straits Espresso Love, and also uh, Layla, uh, they are all, um, they use this typical Dire Straits sequence, the D minor, that's kind of going between D minor and F major. And this will tell you why it's a good, uh, a good example of the Aeolian mode, because these songs are definitely in D minor and Layla is even more interesting in that it, it shifts between C sharp minor and D minor and it, it relates to a question I had last week about you know can you can you use scales um, that are a semitone apart can you and the, the question was about the Lydian can you use a C sharp Lydian and D D Lydian well here's an example of a song in Layla that you can have two sequences in in a key in keys semi uh, semitone apart. So yes, uh, so those two Dire Straits songs. So it shows you that Dire Straits were probably more aware of that folky minor feel than some other bands. REM losing my religion. Uh, Scorpions rock you like a hurricane. Fleetwood Mac Rhiannon. Bon Jovi you give love a bad name. Now I found another one. Stan Jones Ghost Riders in the Sky. Um, and this dates from about 1948. Uh, and again, this is a song that's heavily in the key of A minor, but ends up in F major for part of the chord sequence. So you can see how if you were seeing a song and it goes to the relative major, if you know your relatives, a song that would use the relative major from the minor is a good clue for you that we are in the Aeolian mode. Um, because if you're in the Dorian mode, then a different chord would appear and it wouldn't be F major. And finally, Iron Maiden, The Trooper. Some of these are often quoted and I listened to the ones that were quoted and I found what I thought were the best examples. And then I included some of the other ones that I thought might be interesting. So here we go. Um, Here's the Aeolian mode. Now I have written it out in D minor and I will show you some examples after this of when you're in the key of say, you know, imagine if you had the key of D major and then I can easily show the characteristics that I talked about before. But the characteristics are the root note, looking at the scale, a major second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, Minor sixth, minor seventh. And I'll play that now. This is in the key of D minor. So that's your root note. It D, E major second, F minor third. So there's your minor fill. Here's your perfect fourth. Here's your perfect fifth. So at the moment, as it stands, this could be a Dorian scale. It's the next note that determines whether it's Dorian or whether it's Aeolian. And there's the B flat. Now in the key signature in the scale there is the B flat and that's because it relates to the Ionian mode of F major. F major having one flat. And there's your minor seventh. And when you play the chord of D minor, the scale makes a lot more sense. People say that this is a sad key, and it's definitely a sad key in comparison to the Dorian mode. And I'll play the Dorian mode now, and I'll show you that the difference between the two is the instead of having a minor sixth, you have a major sixth it tends to give you a, a lifting effect.
matter. But if we go to our Aeolian, people think that sounds sad. And it is slightly darker and slightly suppressed. So that's a little bit on the scale itself. And the way that this relates to the F major scale, It's basically all the white notes except the B is a B flat. F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. But now if we play D minor, which is chord six in the key of F major. own. This is what a lot of people think sounds quite folky. And when people are writing in the minor key, especially people who don't really know what they're doing, they they either pick the notes, and this is what I noticed a lot, they pick the notes of the pentatonic scale of D minor even rock bands so they might be writing with those notes uh, really in the forefront of their mind but at some point the giveaways when they play a B flat in the melody there's the B flat sound very rocky, slightly bluesy, and then as soon as you go, or a chord that you play has got that B flat in behind it, but it's when the melody line also does the, you know, includes that B flat, is, is the real giveaway. So, um, definitely uh, an important mode to, to know. Now as we're relating this to the F major scale, um, your F major scale in terms of chord functions, F major would be chord one in, in the key of F major, G minor, A minor, B flat major, C7, which is your dominant chord in the key of F major, then you get to the D minor and that's chord six. But that's where we're starting our chord functions in the Aeolian mode. So it's going to be the same chords. So we only have to play D minor as chord one, as in a minor chord one. And chord two is a minor seven flat five. Or just a pure diminished. Or flat five. So F major is now chord three in the key of D minor. And that means chord four, G minor, A minor. So now we've got this sequence. So we've got chord one, D minor, chord two, E minor seven flat five, chord three, F major, chord four, G minor, chord five, A minor, Chord six, B flat major. Chord seven is C seven. Now, so it's going to be unusual that the dominant chord normally in the key of F major is now our chord seven. And and you have to be careful because if a chord if a song really is in the key of D minor and in using the Aeolian mode, you could very easily confuse this with cadences after the dominant chord if you were really in the key of F major this could be interrupted in in you know going into D minor as in it's like a surprise element it's like saying haha we're not going back to the one chord of F major we are we're in D minor 
So you do have to watch for this. So some songs are quite deceptive that they're actually in the key of F major. Now in terms of sevenths, D minor seven, that's because the seven in D minor is a C natural. D minor seven flat five, as I said before, that's because the seven is a D. F major seven, the seven here is an E natural. G minor seven, that's because the seven in that chord is an F. A minor seven, the seven is a G natural. B flat major seven, because the seven in this instance is an A natural. And uh, we've got our C chord, which is our C7, seven, seven being a B flat. And then we're back to our D minor again. So those are the chord functions in terms of the sevenths. Any of those sevenths would be applicable if you were just writing a song and you're picking out chords. You could either be picking the major and the minor chords from, from the previous chord functions, and wherever you like, you can add in these sevenths. And you could continue adding in ninths as long as they adhere to the scale. But if you want to get into more advanced sort of jazz harmony, then the ninths you can start to alter, but you need excuses for them, and then you need to sort of work out whether you really are still in the, the Aeolian mode. Now I've written the Aeolian mode in some various keys. I'll try and switch camera when I get to the B Aeolian this time. So we've got C Aeolian. Now this is where you need to know your, you can't rely really on your knowledge of the major scale in terms of the relative. Now C Aeolian, starting and finishing on the C, actually relate to the E flat major scale and you've got to really know your flats in order to be able to do this and I wouldn't recommend it I would I would actually think play a scale play a major second which is a D play a minor third which is an E flat play a perfect fourth which is an F play a perfect fifth which is a G play a minor sixth which is an A flat play a minor seventh which is a B flat don't know the shape, the finger, the finger pattern here. This is the way you work it out in using just using pure theory. So you just really, when you play the first three notes, you're just thinking that just a standard minor scale would always do this, unless it's Locrian. Otherwise, a major scale would always do this, or or any of the major type modes. We play the major third, so we're looking for a minor third, and then. We're just looking for perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and then the last three, uh, the last two notes, we're looking for that minor sixth, which is right next to the perfect fifth. So G, A flat, B flat. And that's why you see three flats in that key signature. So I've written it in the key signature as if it's C major. And this is the best way of looking at it in music to note the characteristics, which is the minor third, the minor sixth, and the minor seventh, because you have to write these incidental, um, accidental notes uh, as flats in this particular mode. And I've done the same with the G Aeolian mode. So you can see here, I've written it with a one sharp key signature as if it's in G major, just to highlight the fact that the scale, you can see that the third note in the G Aeolian, G, A, B flat, you can see that that's flattened, so that's your minor. And then C, D, so use perfect fourth, perfect fifth, E flat, there's your, flat, your minor sixth, your minor seventh is an F natural. So if I continue playing, there's the G is the root note, now I'm going to play an A, B flat, C, B, E flat. F, G. Now in the key of D, so this is D Aeolian, so we're thinking we're thinking D minor, but actually I've written the key signature for D major, and this will show you 
where we have to alter the notes in order to see the mode. So here we've got a D root note, we've got an E, and then we've got our F natural, which delineates it, our minor, minor third, and there's the perfect fourth, perfect fifth, the G and the A, B flat, C natural. So we've had to flatten the B, we've had to naturalize the C, and then we've got a D. So if we imagine a D minor chord, Aeolian. So we're thinking in the key, I've written it out in the key signature of A major, which is three sharps, but you can see that we've got an A, a B, a C natural, a D, E, here's your F natural, it's had to be corrected, a G natural, corrected from the original sharp, and then your A. key of E and I've written this out in the key of E major, four sharps, and you can see that the root note is E, F sharp, which is part of the sharps in the key signature, E, F sharp, G natural, our most important minor third note, perfect fourth, A, perfect fifth, B, minor sixth, which has had to be uh, a natural C natural, a D natural, and an E. So I'm going to play an E minor chord. I'm going to switch camera because I didn't do that last week. So we can see the B Aeolian. So we're thinking I've written the key signature out as if it's B major. So you can see the three areas that have had to be naturalized in the scale, which is the third, the sixth, and the seventh. So B, C sharp, D natural. Thinking in, against the chord of B minor. E, F sharp, perfect fourth, perfect fifth. And then we've got an F sharp, G natural, which is your minor sixth, A natural, which is your minor seventh, Hopefully that will help your knowledge of, at least introduces you to a few of these scales. Now onto the tablature. So uh, this is D Aeolian, and this will show you where the notes are on the fretboard. So starting from the top line, the E, the open E string, we've got 0, 1, 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12. 0, 1, 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12. So a good way of practicing this is just to play a D minor chord and then see if you can just improvise using those notes. Same with the B string. One, three, five, six, eight, ten, eleven. Do the same with the G string. Zero, two, three. Because you always find in this B flat, the rest of them are the natural notes. Yeah. 
string 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10 E string will be obviously the same as the top E string, 0, 1, 3, 5, 6, which is where your B flat is, 8, 10, 12. So that's a very good way to get to know the scale and get to know the fretboard. Uh, and if you want, I've written F Ionian. In other words, you can think of it as an F major scale. If you do know those notes and you do know that scale and you want to sort of discover these notes over the fretboard, but you're basically looking out for B flats. So uh, two more scales. Um, to look at all over the fretboard. The first one's the A Aeolian. This will relate to your C major scale. So if you already know your C major scale, and we're thinking in terms of A minor, 0, 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10, 12, and do the same, improvise around those notes. There's nothing particularly to look for on the fretboard because they're all the regular white notes and really this is the starting point and if you don't know anything else about the fretboard you really should learn all of the white notes in other words a b c d e f g no sharps no flats on the b string against an a minor chord zero one three five six eight ten twelve string 0, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 10, 12. And if you want to know the names of these, well, you just count up the scale. G, and then you're going back round to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And on the uh, D string, D, F, obviously it's going to be those white notes again, so 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10, 12. To start with, learn the notes ascending, maybe learn the notes descending, and then see if you can pick the other notes out. Or be completely random. string so open A so 0 2 3 5 7 8 10 12 and then finally the E string the lowest E string 0 1 3 5 7 8 10 12 Moving on to the E minor, Aeolian. Now we've got the F sharp, so we're looking for this note, this note, this note. You know, you're just looking for F sharps all over the fretboard and the rest are just the white notes and you don't play an F, you just play an F sharp. So on the E string, 0, 2, 3, because there's our F sharps on the 2, 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10, 12. String 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10, 12. 
zero one three five seven eight ten twelve. There's our F sharp on fret seven. G string zero two four five seven nine eleven there's our F sharp twelve and there's one interesting characteristic about this that the 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 second note of the scale E F sharp you can really hear that it's it's probably the brightest note in the whole scale. Especially when it functions and it sounds a bit like it's tricking the ear to make you think of a ninth. And that's about the brightest that the scale gets just on that one note. Uh, and then uh, on the D string, uh, zero, two, four, five, seven, nine, ten, twelve. So there's our ninth or second on the F sharp. The minor G sounds quite sad. The minor sixth, or the C, sounds quite sad. The minor seventh sounds quite sad. Sharp second sounds bright. And going on to the A string, zero, two, three, five, seven, nine, there's your F sharp, G, and ten, and twelve. It's the minor sixth on the third, minor seventh on the fifth, and finally on the lowest E string. Open E, two, which is the F sharp, G, A, so zero, two, three, five, seven, eight, ten, twelve. There's a minor sixth there on the eighth, minor seventh on the tenth. The bright sounding the second major second is on the second. Okay, so um, that gives you an idea of the, the improvisation. Um, so, yes, it's, um, this is why people will think it does sound quite folky. Or if you're in A minor. So when you're thinking in terms of the chords, C major obviously is the relative major, so that's why Ghost Riders in the Sky sounds very minor. And it goes to chord five. And it goes to chord six. So you can always spot the, the Aeolian mode as long as you sound very, very rooted in this minor, not the major, that it's not a false minor that's that's leading to. Because there, there is a there are a couple of um, Beatles songs that actually are in F major or the equivalent of F major, and they use the minor as a kind of um, uh, sort of deception, and and it's McCartney who tends to do that uh, more so than the others. Um, there's one track on the Abbey Road album. Uh, anyway, um, so yes, um, and then the next thing is to sort of look at the uh, questions because I sometimes have um, people write in and say say various things during the week. Um, 
Oh, I, I've got a comment here from Military and Emergency Services Church. Um, Martha Algarish says different says different modes mean different things to different cultures. E.g., e miner is happy in some jungles. Um, well, yes. Um, well, of course. I'm. I'm. I would. I don't think I'd ever say that um, anything has to be specifically happy or sad, because obviously it's, it's it's really saying that things are happy and sad are ways of describing. They're really the earliest stages of describing how music c can be heard, um, to especially to children, and you could actually scrub out the word children and say adults that don't have any musical training because if you want to say that um, I mean Mozart was a, a specialist in writing sad sounding music in the major key uh, so um, you know if, if particular um, culture some cultures may in their folk music may um, uh, use the minor modes in a different way um, and and some people will, will use it in a happy way and, and a sad way. Um, you can I mean you can listen to Irish folk songs and you know other British type folk songs or uh, Scottish folk songs and hear that some if you write it in say with the rhythmic style of a jig or a jig uh, as uh, it would be pronounced in Europe, then uh, even if it's in a minor key, um, you know it'll, it'll sound happy because it's going to be a dance of some sort. So and and. Uh, unless it's a very slow dance, then it's going to have the feel of something happy. But I think ultimately, it's learning modes is is about the way you think about um, the way you think about them in terms of the scale characteristics, and then you can apply them in any way that you like. Um, and and uh, when I say that it's something is reflective, what you're doing is you're looking for those key characteristics in the scale, such as in this instance the the second note, the major second, and you, and you and and if it's pulling one way or the other, you know it, it doesn't necessarily mean it, it's it's telling you to write something that sounds happy at that point. But it, it's good to know uh, because these are the scale shape characteristics, and you'll find this a lot, especially in Indian music, where they will actually teach uh, in a very restrictive way in some instances that a certain degree of the scale is has a certain personality. Um, so. Uh, it's all often worth looking at this. Um, South American cultures will be writing different music in minor keys, and you know, you listen to Brazilian music. If you listen to, uh, say, a samba, you know, that's that's going to be happy and yet it's in a minor key so it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be sad and as I say listen to Mozart you can listen to any uh, Mozart where he's he's actually written sad music in the major key um, but yeah so it's a good good point anyway and I had a couple of other comments um, switching to the phone now for the comments on um, some of my other videos and so what I've been doing is anytime anybody's been writing in I've been um, basically writing to them to say well I mentioned you in a video and I've answered your question there um, I just hope it's a bit more of a personal answer than uh, just I, I was writing the comments in the comment section before um, uh, so let's find out where, where it went so I got a comment on my um, loot video I did this I did this video where I've got a I've got a pickup in a baroque lute, and um, so I can I can play it plugged into an amp. So I did a demonstration of of this um, plugged in effect, and and I put it through a, a Boss metalizer um, that was um, it was um, customized by um, Hello Sailor Effects, and uh, so I've just had a comment come in on that video. Um, the um, bag, the bag, Dagna, I think the name is, uh, D Bad Agna, and um, says uh, there's music like this in, in the score for Jim Jamish's film Only Lovers Left Alive. Well, I don't know that film. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, and and the same person, uh, 
also commented, don't forget to add the video in the video description above which country and city was this filmed. Well, it's filmed in London. Um, what type of strings does this instrument has on it? Well, the, the strings on that one are Aquila. Then they're called Nile Gut. And they're like um, a sort of composite um, uh, uh, way of... Um, so in other words, a kind of plastic. But um, they replicate the sound of a gut string uh, so yes yeah, so they're all they're all Aquila strings all, all of my lutes are uh, when I say all of my lutes I've got two I've got a Renaissance lute and a Baroque lute so they've both got Aquila strings on them but um, normally if you know me and you know my videos you'll know that most of my stuff's recorded in in London or around in England usually unless I state otherwise uh, Amber uh, commented uh, on one of my Schoenberg videos and I don't know how many of you know who Arnold Schoenberg is but he's probably the, the leading theoretician of the 20th century in my opinion um, a formidable 12-tone uh, uh, composer that most people would say was writes atonal music but he became a 12-tone composer and uh, and really a one of the one of the founding fathers of the 12-tone music and he didn't necessarily discover 12 tone music but he certainly perfected the 12 tone style and he was one of the earliest people to really push that as a as a new musical style so i recorded some of his piano pieces and amber commented uh saying uh, absolutely love this hard to find such fantastic videos of schoenberg's work for guitar well uh wow um yeah they weren't easy to record um there were six six movements of what was transcribed piano music and it was it was actually a friend of mine who sent me the scores because he works for universal music so he sent me the scores as a gift just to say you know he's an old he's an old friend of mine from, from my very youngest college days music college days and uh, he was very kind enough to provide me with a Schoenberg score so I thought well I better record these just to show that I've done something with the scores um, so if you're not familiar with Schoenberg's work, then, you know, look up those pieces um, on on my Everything Guitar site and you'll, you'll see what I mean. They are quite horrendous in terms of, you know, they don't make any harmonic sense in the in our, the way we're working on these modes and scales and the rest of it. They're, it's almost like playing random notes, but they're not. They're very specific notes. Cosmic Debris um, commented and Cosmic Debris very often comments on quite a number of my videos and uh, clearly got a, a wild sense of humour and he said um, he's replying to the fact that I mentioned him on the last live broadcast and he said everything guitar thanks for the mention I'm surprised you didn't say some nutter called cosmic degree keeps writing um, silly comments you are a brilliant guitarist and teacher and have great personality some would argue with you on that um, I've bitten off much more than I can chew learning several bo complex Bach pieces along with life's problems so learning about modes etc is a bit overwhelming at the moment. Years ago when I was stupidly trying to play like Vi and Satriani your video tutorials would have been like gold dust keep up the good work. Well thank you very much uh, Mr I'm assuming it's a Mr Cosmic Debris um, got a feeling I know you from somewhere um, uh, well, thanks for saying that I'm a brilliant guitarist. Again, you know, don't know whether people really agree with that. I've just a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, so yes, if you've if you've learnt Bach and uh, you uh, were interested in Vi and Satriani, then you know you're going to come across scales and modes and and the rest of it. So um, you know whatever style of music you're doing, pretty much, unless you're doing purely atonal music scales and modes are going to be important so um and yes it is just about what how much time you have to be able to take on these concepts um so um i had another couple of comments from what looks like a russian name which i cannot pronounce so um he says his name is michael anyway i'm going to just say michael uh, beautiful music maestro and this talking about uh, what is this? Uh, Kep oh, um, I'm doing a series on Michael Keplinger. Um, he's, he's composed these these pieces called 22 Vignettes. 
So I'm, I'm presently recording, I think I'm up to about number, I've just recorded number 12, I think it is. So I think we might be up to 11 on the ones that I've put out. I, I can't quite remember. He's put beautiful music, Maestro. I subscribe to your website. Um, so and he's commented on a couple of other pieces, although the more vignettes. Um, and then Dottie Webb says, I'm going to try to watch all of your videos, particularly the modal ones, as they're a great insight into all types of musical structures and quite fascinating. So thank you. Well, no, well, no thank you. Um, I hope they help someone. I don't know. Um, they can only help people, and I will explain it in some ways that probably helped me when I started to learn them. So obviously there's a multitude of videos out there on YouTube about scales and modes, but I don't think that all of them can be that helpful you know um maybe if you see mine you might find minor you might find that i mentioned some angle um on them that might really help unlock the doors for you if that's what you're trying to do um especially for those people that are st stuck in a rut and trying to improvise um uh todd lane uh todd he he quite often comments on my videos. He said, I like that, um, what's he talking about? It's, it's a Fernando Saw, Opus 44, number 12. And again, I'm recording the whole of the Opus 44 Fernando Saw studies at the moment. So uh, he said, I like the part at one minute, 10 seconds, which is very specific. Um, well played, uh, Dale. Uh, I have a guitar question for, for uh, that you may not have an answer for. Are you familiar with Ralph Towner and John Abercrombie? What do you think? And what do you think of... Uh, Pepe Romero. Uh, well, uh, Ralph Towner and John Abercrombie were both introduced to me by a very good friend of mine who I made an album with called Dark Tales. Um, and it started with, with Jez Henderson and, and uh, we used to listen to music together because he had a quite an extensive ECM record collection. And, and that was when I started to really listen to the whole of that ECM label recordings. And that's where I really got to know Ralph Towner in Oregon and uh, John Abercrombie and actually there were a couple of records that I had of John Abercrombie um, and that I used to listen to over and over again because I was just fascinated with the both the sound that he makes and the style and of course Ralph Towner if you ever listen to Oregon and you're not familiar with them uh, it's beautiful music and it's 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 great driving music so we're really good in the car uh, what do I think of Pepe Romero well I've seen Anthel Romero, his brother, um, in in a classical guitar recital, and I know Pepe Romero from his videos and his um, his arrangements. Uh, and he was one of the first guitarists that I heard that I thought really could nail the flamenco style as well as uh, classical. And uh, I'm, I remember hearing him play some really lovely flamenco type music. Um, in, you know, this is in the 1980s. So I've got great respect for him and, and, and the work that he's done with uh, Rodrigo playing his compositions. He, you know, he's a formidable guitarist. So, uh, yeah, I do I do listen to Pepe Romero and uh, I do appreciate um, Ralph Tanner and John Abercrombie, you know, a lot more than perhaps you'd know from what, just watching me through classical guitar videos. Uh, and then Cosmic Degree, as, as I mentioned again about... I did a video on this... Um, Dal Bay um, and two minuets it's one of my most recent videos and it's this sort of baroque sounding minuet uh, one and two and he wrote um, uh, Dal Bay who? Uh, another guy who I have to look up yeah exactly um, I didn't know either so uh, um, I put out a couple of posts to say Dal Bay you know who knew uh, I'd never heard of him so um, and I'm quite into my classical so um Maybe look that that piece up. Um, Snowfire Sunwind commented. That's a great name, isn't it? Snowfire Sunwind. Um, Mar on Mero Giuliani's Opus 139, number three. And again, I'm recording the whole of the Opus 139 so, um, uh, series at the moment. So number three came out on Saturday. And he's put great performance and the guitar sounds really good. Well, it's a Stephen Hill guitar. It's going to sound good, you know. It's a lovely guitar, and uh, well, I, I do my best on the performances. It's not not always easy sitting in a room to, playing classical guitar to a camera, um, but I'm getting used to it. Um, and then Cosmic Debris 
has mentioned again the same video the Giuliani Opus 39 a 139 number three and he said great nice playing maestro so well thank you very much can't say any more to that as long as one person enjoys it then that's worth it uh and one Carlos Rodriguez Panisa commented on yes on the Giuliani again said excellent um did our, uh, 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 as anecdotal, I was giving me some anecdotal data. Giuliani played the cello at the premiere of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony uh, on December the eighth, uh, eighteen thirteen. Yeah, it's quite a famous quote that from to think that Giuliani, who for us guitarists is a you know a revered composer, to think he was playing cello at the premiere of a, a Beethoven um, symphony is quite quite something, especially in eighteen thirteen. Um, where other great musicians, he continues to say, where other great musicians such as um, Johann Nepomuk, Nepomuk Hummel, and May Seder and Louis Spohr uh, also participated. Well, I don't know those musicians, so if someone can enlighten me, otherwise I'll look them up sometime. But um, so those are the comments this week, and uh, thank you for everybody for commenting. Um, there's one other comment that's just come in from Sam. Uh, it might be unrelated to the topic, but what is the most defining factor in producing tone quality? I'm presuming you mean the fingers. Uh, you'll have to tell me whether that's what you mean. Do you mean the fingers or do you mean the tone quality in the scale? I'm presuming you mean the fingers. So I'm going to start talking about that and I'll see if you happen to write anything in the comments just to say that. But... What I, th what I think you're talking to is saying, what is the most de defining factor in producing tone quality? Well, first of all, if you're playing an acoustic guitar, don't believe all of the videos that tell you that strings are the most important thing, because I guarantee you, you could put the worst strings on a guitar and you could get someone like John Williams or when he was around, Julian Bream or Segovia, or any of the, think of any of the great guitarists, they could make a shoebox with a couple of, strings and the yogurt pot at the other end or something sound good so um tone you hear this quote a lot tone is in the fingers um now if you're a nail player can i get my nails on screen <laughs> so if you're a nail player nails can be part of your tone but if you hear lutenists playing lutenists don't use nails they have a different technique so so tone is not necessarily in nails, but it, it's down to the angle that you play the string to get the tone quality. So, but what is the most defining factor in the tone quality? Well, if we're talking about right hand only, if I play with just the nail, I'm gonna try and get an, a bad sound. quite a clicky sound so imagine if I was to play or like a I better not play anything copyrighted it's going to be down in terms of what I think it's down to the angle of the fingers that you play at So for most guitarists, it will be finding the tone. So if you're if you're a finger player, it's finding the tone. Now, the tone obviously is determined by where you play on the string because there's more tension here than there is here for the reason that the string is much flappier here than it is here. But the tone is sharper here and, the, and sweeter here. But if you play it wrong, and I'm just picking the string up, you get a bad sound. So, so plucking upwards will get you a bad sound. So it, from an engineering point of view, you actually want to be plucking downwards, like into the sound hole. But it's not always going to be, because when you're playing with the fingers, you're actually playing upwards. You're sort of almost playing it so you're plucking towards the armpit 
So even if you're playing bass guitar, you're you're still in a way playing as if you're plucking towards the armpit. Or, or I would advise trying that if you're if you're using your fingers, if you're using your thumb, you'll see a lot of jazz guitarists using the flesh of their thumb rather than the nail. And I'm literally just using this part of my thumb to play. So that gets a softer tone quality. So part of uh, answering this question of what is the most defining factor will be, are you playing with nails? Are you playing with flesh? Are you using a pick? And there is such a thing as bad tone production even if you're a pick player. Because it will be dependent on if you hold the pick too far back, you're going to have a lot more flap. In the, in the sound. Not only that, but if the plectrum is too thin, you're going to get flap in the sound. So if your plectrum is too thick, you're going to get quite a muddy sound. So the, the thickness that you choose to use is going to be dependent on the style that you play, the way that you hold the plectrum. I'm not really answering your question because there are so many factors involved um, that Really, I would say, well, as a classical player, I know that once I've worked on an angle, I might continue to work at that angle. And I might try and get the best tone possible. The next thing to do is, if you're a nail player, to file the nails. Obviously, you want your nails to be polished. Uh, I don't have any file, file um, any any paper here, but um, the way that you file your nails. Um, so when it comes to the nail, the shape, and also not just the shape, but the thinking of the nail like a ramp. So it starts at, at one point of the finger and, and ends when it hits the string going to another part of the finger. But also the shape, when I say the shape of the nail, it's also... If you imagine the edge of the nail, the very edge, you know, I've got a slight dip in this nail at the moment, so I need to file it, but um, um, sometimes the shape of your nail will determine the tone. But also, the actual nail itself, you can round it off. So if you imagine that your nail is a thick object like this, and it's doing, say, I don't know what, doing that or something, it's going to be, you, ideally you want it slightly rounded. You don't want it a hard edge, so when it hits that string, that can make a difference. So, um, so it's yes. The most defining factor is how you're going to make contact with the string. So that that that's the one thing. But then from that, it's going to be down to the angle of the attack, the amount of attack, and the surface area of the thing that you are attacking the string with, whether it's a finger, whether it's a plectrum. So even when it comes to a plectrum, check the edges. You know, check check it because old old plectrums don't make a, a good sound. And uh, so, uh, if you're trying to make a really good tone, sometimes not just the edges, but the actual surface area itself of the plectrum. So, these are all factors. Now, if you're playing an electric guitar and you've got loads and loads of distortion, the the plectrum's not going to be such a factor. But when you play on the covered strings, they got they are going to scrape, scrape, and of course, some some players um, make uh, that uh, actually a feature of of uh, the, their playing. So they might make a scrapey sound or, or like a. They might actually use bad tone as a as a way of. You know, giving you some sort of uh, an extra tonal effect. Um, so you just need to think about the factors involved, and then obviously gauge of your string, how thick or thin the strings are, the string type will make a, a difference again. Um, but I think the the initial factors is how you're going to make contact with the string, and 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 if the string is flapping about too much, you might need to reconsider where you play on the string, and if the string is flapping about too much still. You may need to reconsider the, the strings that you have, put slightly heavier strings on, slightly thicker strings, 
you know, or chain string type. Um, in terms of classical guitars or flamenco guitars, you know, you have carbon strings which are brighter, or you can have nylon strings which are darker. Um, you can have, on a flamenco, you tend to have lighter strings, uh, lighter gauge strings. Uh, they've got a bit more movement in them, and you tend to have the action lower. And if the action is lower, um, you, again, you're going to get more flap in the string because there's going to be less tension. Um, and, and especially because when you, when you pluck the note, you've got less distance to go before it hits the fret. Uh, so you could be you know, encountering more fret buzz and things like that. So um, hopefully that's answered your question. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no one right answer. Uh, I think you need to sort of discover where the tone that you like making and how you're mm -hmm. going to go about it and if it's practical to do that. Um, and the final consideration is don't injure yourself putting your hand in some strange contorted uh, way, um, you know, in order to make good tone. Uh, it should really come at the natural, hopefully a natural angle. And if, if you're playing with a guitar strap, change the, change the guitar strap and... You know, it's the same with, I've got, um, I've, for this demonstration, I've got one of these. So um, that changes the angle of the way I'm sitting. So um, obviously the, the angle that you have the guitar is going to affect the tone. That was a long convoluted answer. So uh, anyway, I hope that helps uh, everybody. Um, and I hope you, you've been enjoying this mode series, the people that have been watching it. Next time I'll be doing the Locrian mode, uh, probably the most obscure of the modes. Um, and I'm going to have really struggle to find any songs that use the Locrian mode. And, um, and then I'll be thinking of another topic to do. Um, so I've got a couple of ideas. Um, so you'll, you'll probably find out next week what, what, what's going to be going on. But uh, thank you everybody for watching and thank you for those that have commented on the other videos and commented during this session. And uh, hopefully I shall see you all soon. So take care and keep practicing. <laughs> Bye.